Zachary Taylor, the 12th President of the United States, was born in Virginia in 1784, but his family immediately moved the infant just outside the tiny river town of Louisville, where Zachary would spend most of his life. His father built their home on the family plantation, Springfield, overlooking Brownsboro Road near the modern-day Watterson Expressway. The house was under construction for, for several years, and it was finished by 1790 and it was a side hall colonial. This was the frontier. And uh, some of the, one of the books that I've got said that, that by the door every night the uh, uh, rifle was, was uh, put down in, in uh, anticipation that maybe the Indians would attack. Springfield was a plantation, exposing Taylor to an issue that would follow him to his presidency. The Taylor family were slaveholders, and so Taylor grew up in a slaveholding family, a slaveholding society. Kentucky was a slave state. After spending his youth at Springfield, Taylor joined the Army. Zachary proved to be a natural leader. Taylor rose to the rank of general, and his main theater of operations was the South, where in one engagement he earned the name Rough and Ready while fighting Seminole Indians in Florida. His stature as a national hero grew during the Mexican War. In the Mexican War, he usually had great odds against him as far as number of forces. And he led after one, in one battle after another from uh, uh, Palo Alto and Osaka de la Palma to Monterey, and then of course his huge victory at Buena Vista. Because his time in the South would be measured in years, Taylor and his wife Margaret bought a home in Louisiana. He lives most of his life as, as kind of his home base when he's not serving off in, at military posts in Louisiana. And he has a farm down there, a plantation down there, and he himself is a slaveholder. But all the while, Zachary Taylor remained a Kentuckian, often returning to the home where his children were born. One daughter would marry a future president of the United States, the Confederate United States. Sarah Knox Taylor married Jefferson Davis, of course, who served under Zachary Taylor in the Black Hawk War. I was one of his officers. Taylor disapproved of the marriage, not wanting his daughter to live the tough military life his Margaret had endured. Jefferson Davis would actually resign his commission to gain Sarah's hand in marriage. Sadly, just three months after the wedding, Sarah died of malaria on the way to the Davis home. After she died, uh, there was a point where Taylor and, and uh, Jefferson Davis ended up at the same place, and Taylor came up and put his arm around Jefferson Davis and said, my daughter was a better judge of character than I was. Taylor's popularity as a military hero and his history with slavery drew the attention of the Southern Whig Party. Their agenda was to extend slavery into new states being admitted to the Union. And in 1848, they chose Taylor as their presidential candidate to carry that banner. Old Rough and Ready would go on to victory. But as president, Taylor led his administration to do just the opposite of his party's wishes. One of the things that threw his Southern supporters is upon his election to president, he actually proposes that California and New Mexico come in as free states. And this, of course, was a shocker to them because they said, here's a slaveholder, here's a southerner, he'll back us. Animosity grew between Taylor and the South, and the country was on the verge of war. South Carolina, as it would do 10 years later, threatened to secede. You know, he said, if you try to secede because you don't, you're not getting your way, we'll march down there with an army and, uh, and stop you because you cannot secede. This is the United States and you can't just decide you, you're gonna leave it because things aren't going your way. But this fight would suddenly end on July 4th, 1850. On a very hot day, after laying the cornerstone for the new Washington Monument, Taylor sat down to cool off with a seemingly innocent bowl of cherries and a pitcher of milk. Five days later, Zachary Taylor would die. He died of what was called cholera morbus, 
uh, which was really a, a, a severe attack of gastroenteritis. And, uh, and he, may have, he may have actually recovered from it, but the medical theories and practices of the day pretty much assured his death because they bled him, they purged him, they blistered him, and over the course of several days after he initially took sick, it so weakened him that it essentially helped kill him. He was buried in Kentucky in the family cemetery just 300 yards from his home of Springfield. Conspiracy theories arose suggesting that he was actually poisoned, making him our first assassinated president. In 1991, Taylor's body was exhumed and an autopsy for arsenic performed. The test proved negative and Taylor was laid back to rest. After such a short presidency, most Kentuckians would forget that Zachary Taylor considered this his home. This was home. This was home. Kentucky was home, as, as seen by the fact that this is where he's buried. There was an article in the uh, local paper years ago it was talking about the things that Louisville isn't. And they said, for instance, Louisville is not the home of a president. Well, yes, it is. Shortly after World War I, the United States acquired the land around his grave, creating the Zachary Taylor National Cemetery. It is home to veterans from every American war, including Taylor's father, who served in the Revolutionary War. And it is still home to the only United States president buried in Kentucky.